You may find me on Twitter at both British Stone and Cash of Labs. And Cash of Labs is the convenient sized uh, research consultancy that I run here in Portland. We do things with data, data science, data visualization, and also user experience research, mostly of the ethnographic persuasion. So before we get to the transparency bit, I want to kick things off with what an algorithm is. So, broadly speaking, an algorithm is just a finite ordered list of instructions that takes inputs and produces an output. It's pretty broad and can apply to a lot of different things. For instance, you can think of recipes as algorithms. Uh, here, for instance, we have an algorithm for a smoothie. You take yogurt and mango and ice, and then you, you follow the instructions in your recipe, and out pops a smoothie. But the outputs of your algorithm depend on your inputs. If you have no ingredients to run through your blender, you are not going to get a smoothie. No ingredients, no smoothie. Similarly, if you have bad ingredients, you are going to have a bad smoothie. If you are putting rocks and wood chips and motor oil into your, your blender, you are going to have a giant mess. You are probably going to ruin your blender. It'll be a bad time. And do not recommend that input to our smoothie algorithm. Now, the ability to analyze whether an output is, or an input is good, is really important because we are also algorithms. We take stimulus from our environments, and some really complex biological stuff happens, and out pop thought, and out pop to action, we are algorithms. Because we are algorithms. We can only think about things that have been input to us. We can only think about things that we've been exposed to. This is one of the reasons that diverse teams are really, really important, because diverse teams have been exposed to diverse experiences, diverse ideas, and as a result, produce, have more thoughts. They can think about a broader range of things. And a broader range of thoughts produces more robust products. Diverse team, better product. So we can only think about the things we've been exposed to. Further, evaluating the quality of the inputs we receive is absolutely necessary to evaluate the quality of our thoughts. Let's think about our, our smoothie algorithm again. If you did not know that motor oil rocks and wood chips were not edible, you wouldn't necessarily know that the resulting smoothie was really probably not very good for you. So it's very important that we be able to evaluate the inputs to the algorithm that is our brain. Poison control agrees with me. They don't want you drinking smoothies made of strange things. So this is the problem with okay algorithms. Right now, we use a lot of different algorithms to access information, to input information into the biological algorithm of our brain. So, the problem with these opaque algorithms, we don't really know what the inputs are, we don't know what they're doing to process the inputs, and we don't know how the inputs relate to the outputs. And those outputs are what are coming into our biological algorithm. So, those op the opaqueness of those algorithms interfere with our ability to evaluate how good the inputs to our algorithm are. That's really a problem. A transparent algorithm, on the other hand, means that there are no secrets. Um, a transparent algorithm is not squirreling away extra inputs under the bed. It's not, you know, hiding secret processing things in the cupboards. It is letting everything hang out for the user to scrutinize. But very specifically, what I need are these four things. So a transparent, a transparent algorithm, you can see 
all of the inputs. If someone's sneaking motor oil into your smoothie, you want to know about that. Uh, control surfaces are clearly described. So our blender had control surfaces. It has, you know, an on switch, an off switch, maybe it has a variety of speeds. I don't really know, I don't have a blender, but it has some control surfaces that you can interact with. So those control surfaces need to be clearly described and you need to understand how changing those control surfaces impacts the processing of the algorithm. For instance, maybe if you make a smoothie on super high, it actually spits smoothie all over your kitchen counter. That kind of thing. So, control services need to be clearly described. The steps that the algorithm takes and the internal state that it maintains can be scrutinized. So you can look into the algorithm and be like, wow, that's, that's really strange. Or, oh neat, that's really cool. Additionally, assumptions made by the algorithm are clearly documented and described. I did a project working with GPS data, and GPS data comes to you as a stream. It's just timestamp, here I am at this point, here I am at this point. Um, but the question that the researchers I was working with were interested in is, what makes a drive routine? Well, how do you define a drive? There are lots of different ways to define a drive. We ended up defining a drive as a from a place where you've been for more than 10 minutes to a place where you're going to be for more than 10 minutes. But that's an assumption. That is just a definition that I built into my analyses after um, you know, a variety of tests. And that must be documented for an algorithm to be transparent. Because otherwise they're like, well, you know, where did this magic definition for defective of drive come from? And if I hadn't made one of those, let's say that had been handed to me by the, the company that tracked the GPS, if I didn't know that, it would impact my ability to evaluate how good my models were. So it's really important that assumptions and internal models that the algorithm use are, are clearly described and documented. Finally, and this one is important, justifications are available for the output. So for any given output, you should be able to say, huh, well that's kind of funny. You know, why did I end up with wood chips in my smoothie? And you should be able to look back at the algorithm and see, oh, well, um, someone froze wood chips in the ice cubes. Or, oh, this algorithm, you know, puts wood chips in every 100th smoothie. Like, those are things that you would want to know. So you need to be able to find out why you received a particular output from a particular input. Before we go into how we're accessing the information now, I want to talk about how we use to access information. Now, I grew up before the internet. That's no, sorry. Uh, I think we got dial up when I was in seventh or eighth grade. Yeah, the creaking mode of any kind. I mean, that was back when the web was mostly GeoCities web rings and AOL chat rooms. And certainly, the, the radical differences in the way that we access information now had not begun to trickle down into my education. So a lot of my education was focused on algorithms for information retrieval. Atlases, for example. So, Atlases, if you have never encountered one, is a big book of maps. And the algorithm for accessing information is you start with, say, a city name that you are interested in. And you would either look in the table of contents, or you would look in the index for that name. That name would direct you to a page number. You flip to a page number and generally a grid number. You would flip to page number, find the grid, and then you have the spatial information you were looking at. That is an information retrieval algorithm. Dictionaries! Oh man, dictionaries! Great big books of words in alphabetical order. You would start with an input, a word, and you'd flip to the section with you know, the first letter of that word, right? 
and you'd keep flipping to find the section with the first two letters, and so on and so forth, until you found your word. That's an algorithm. Card catalogs. I hear these are quite popular as furniture now. Uh, back before you had it all on a computer, you would go to the card catalog and find the card that referenced your book by alphabetically by last name of the author, and then it would give you a number, and then you would walk through the shelves until you found one with a similar number, and then you would hone in on your book by looking for closer and closer numbers. That is an algorithm. Now, the important part of these algorithms is not that they are analog and now charmingly retro, although that, as I said, charmingly retro. The important part is that they were known. Not only were they known, they were explicitly taught. We took the time, of my education a lot of time being taught and tested over these various ways of retrieving information because the access of new information, the ability to find new information profoundly influences what we are able to think about. And everyone, everyone was given these algorithms. They were open. They were transparent. Contrast that with how we do things now. So let's say that I want to go to Sock Dreams. Sock Dreams is this fantastic shop, sock shop in, in Selwood in Portland. And if you haven't been, I definitely recommend it. I promise they're not, they're not paying me to say it. It's just a great sock shop. And, uh, and I'm new to Portland. I moved here about two years ago. And I can never remember how to get started. So I go to the GPS provider of my choice, or map provider of my choice. I use Google Maps, but there are a zillion out there, I'm sure. The first really big one was Tom Tom. Anyway, and I, I ask for directions from where we are now to Soft Dreams. Soft Dreams is off the map, unfortunately. And it gives me these three options. As input, I've given it a start point and my end point. I have changed a control surface to tell it that I want to drive, and it magically pops out these three route choices. And they're annotated with the distance and the approximate time. But I have no idea why these three routes have been suggested. Now, I can guess. I suspect the algorithm optimizes on distance and time. It's trying to give me the shortest distance and the shortest time or some combination of the two. But I don't know that. For all I know, the algorithm is actually optimizing my journey to go buy the greatest number of donut shops. I have no way of knowing. And that has an impact in how I perceive the city. These routes, what I see along these routes, helps me build my model of the city. And what I don't see is important. If I don't know what I'm not seeing, then I can't adjust for it. And that's a problem. So let's look at Facebook. We use algorithms to manage our relationships now. I use Facebook to manage a lot of my long distance relationships with people that I don't interact with often. It's great because I can sort of keep track of them. I can have these lightweight interactions that are the equivalent of small talk in face-to-face in -face interaction so that we stay connected and I can keep maintaining that relationship. Or at least that's what I used to do when Facebook was young before they went public and far long before they started doing all these weird things with the news feed. I have no idea why certain things show up in my news feed. No clue. Um, I have Intuitions. I know that they take my friends list and my activity, but they don't tell you really what activity is. So I know it has something to do with the whole likes, the things you like, and the things that you interact with. And based on that algorithm or that input, the algorithm decides who gets to show up in my newsfeed. Well, if my newsfeed, if I don't go and click on each one of my around 200 some odd friends, then all I'm getting from Facebook is what shows up in my news feed. So, in my case, in my experience, it seems like they are really optimizing in favor of people that I interact with frequently. 
thereby defeating the entire purpose of my interaction with Facebook. If I interact with them frequently, I'm going to be texting them, I'm going to be emailing them. I don't need the service for that. What I needed Facebook for was to help me maintain the relationships with people I don't interact with. But regardless, there's no real way for us to know, and there's certainly no real way for us to, to change how it is choosing. Now, people develop superstitions. I had a friend tell me, oh, well, I, I just had a browser window open with Facebook and then did a lot of things that made it look like I liked certain things in the other browser tabs um, to try and make her advertising more accurate. I actually changed my gender on Facebook because I was tired of, they were giving me ultrasound technician ads over and over and over again. You become an ultrasound technician, become an ultrasound technician. Which is great if you want to be an ultrasound technician or really, really like images of fetuses. I find them creepy. So I changed my gender and suddenly I'm getting custom log cutting ads. So people develop <laughs> these ways of building control services when none exist. Facebook, it's really okay. But the one that really bothers me is search engines. So I had floppy chives, like climbed in the herb garden and my chives were like, meh. They had given up the will to live and I didn't know why, so naturally I turned to Google, right? And there were lots of results. I have no idea why they were turned in a particular order. I have no idea why, why one result is considered better than another. Now, Google admittedly did publish PageRank some time ago, I think back in 2004, they published PageRank, which is the algorithm they were using to build a search graph and then decide how things should be like. But they're not using PageRank anymore, at least not exclusively. They've moved on to TrustRank or something else. They do have search documentation, but all it really says is, we use lots of complicated variables to give you the best search experience, yeah. which is great, except that we don't know what those variables are. And, and this is, the internet is arguably one of the greatest stores of human knowledge yet to exist. And we are beholden, like our primary interface for interacting with it are these company, for-profit companies using opaque black box algorithms to provide us results automatically. That's great when it works. But what about when it stops working? That is not a safe and sustainable way to continue having access to this wealth of information. The problem with all of these black box algorithms, and I know I picked on uh, you know big web platforms now, but it extends to basically any opaque algorithm, is that their opacity prevents us from scrutinizing the actual details of their algorithm. As long as they're continuing to operate in good faith, as long as the incentives align such that, you know, our goals are the same, such that they benefit more from providing us what we think they're providing uh, than from doing something else, and they're golden. But publicly traded for-profit companies are not beholden to us. They are legally beholden to their shareholders. They are entities for making profit, and particularly in the case of um, free uh, platform as a service ad driven products, we are not their customers. Advertisers are their customers. As long as we're in this tenuous balance where the advertisers benefit most from providing us good search results, for instance, they're in good shape. But we won't know when that changes. We don't know why Google returns the results in a particular order. We don't know why Facebook puts particular things in particular places. And it is at best naive and at worst 
grossly negligent to leave such an important resource in the hands of opaque algorithms. Now, you see where it's a problem. What can we do about this? How can we rip off the wrapping of the opaque algorithms? First, support projects that use transparent algorithms. Um, open source is a great place to start. There are actually a variety of open source search engines. Um, the, the Internet Archive is doing fantastic work, fantastic work. I hope many of you have that talk this morning. If not, there will be videos up on the Internet Archive for you to watch later. I definitely recommend it. Um, so you can support those projects, and if, you, if the projects don't yet exist, you can start them. In fact, one that I really like to see, and it might be a good fit for collaboration with the Internet Archive, is a, a free and open index of the Internet. So the expensive part of a search engine is crawling and maintaining an index of something as big as the Internet, and updating it and storing all of that information is very expensive. That prevents us from building open, transparent, competing algorithms. So if we all pooled our resources, built such a free and open index, then various transparent algorithm search engines could use that index. How cool would it be to be able to see how something would rank in competing search engines? It would be very cool. So that's one way we can support transparent algorithms. Also, from the algorithms you use daily, because I'm not about to give up Google search, I imagine most of you aren't either, we can demand transparency from them. Now, okay, arguably the incentives are not really aligned for them to care at all what you want, but we can try, we can make some noise. Finally, you can foster algorithm transparency in your own projects. Now, before I get to that one, I want to talk a little bit about some of the, the pushback that I've gotten on this idea. One of the things I've heard, but my algorithms are already open source. That's great. I am so happy for you and for the future security of human knowledge. That's great. Keep your algorithm open source. None of this closed source nonsense. But your users haven't read your source. I haven't read your source. Probably, unless they are really trying to change something specific, if they're going to become a contributor, they haven't read your source. It's not the same as transparency. It is not enough. It is necessary. Open source is necessary for transparency, but it is not, it is not sufficient. You must build on that. Alright. But my users still want to know! Everyone wants the magic racial! Why are you killing the magic? Why do you hate that? Okay. I love magic as much as the next person. I do. I think it's great when something deliver something to exactly what I want, exactly what I need, exactly how I want it, but this isn't about convenience. We have convenience. What this is about is the future security of all of human knowledge. This is about ethics. It is part of your ethical burden as a developer to make sure that your users have the opportunity to understand what your algorithm is doing. You are shaping how they think and part of your responsibility is to make sure that they understand how you're doing that shaping. Ah, this one. <laughs> my algorithm is so advanced, I can't explain it to my users. No. Okay, I'm gonna level with you. This is some techno elitist bullshit. And I know we are all too good at what we do to buy into this. If your users do not understand your algorithm, it is not a problem with your users, it is a problem with your explanation. Talk to your users, talk to your users, talk to your users until you can come up with an explanation that they can drive with. All right. Now, how to chew your way out of your OB boxes. I'm just saying this. Talk to your users. Ask them. Now, admittedly, as I said, I am a user experience researcher, I do monographies, I serve your users, it's great. I am biased in this regard. I think you should be talking to your users all the time, but especially in this. So ask them, how do you think it works? What do they think is going on? And don't, you're not lecturing them. 
you're asking. You, want to, you really want to understand their perspective. Uh, what control do you think they have over your outputs? This is a really funny question because, as I mentioned, I develop superstitions around technology, and I think a lot of people do. Um, blowing into the Nintendo cartridge can actually work. Restarting can actually work, but sometimes, sometimes it's just that it worked once and you do it from there on after because you think that it is necessary to make it work. So that gets fun stories about the superstitions your users have developed. And then ask them about what they wish they knew, if they could know anything about your algorithm. All right, so then, then, do the documentation, Batman! This is back to what we talked about, what makes a transparent algorithm. You need to tell your users what inputs the algorithm is working on, what the internal state of the algorithm is, what is it maintaining internally, um, and how does that impact what it outputs. What assumptions, this is really big, what assumptions and models does the algorithm use? Your assumptions really impact your outputs. Again, control surfaces. How can they impact how the algorithm is running? And then, why was a given result produced? Now, I'm actually going to give a tiny shout out to Google for this particular one. Their search net, but priority inbox is actually pretty good about letting the user know why something was sorted as important. I don't know if you're familiar with priority inbox, it basically splits it into important stuff and not important stuff. And it marks it with a little yellow arrow, it's important. In the email, from the header, it says, this was marked as important because. Now admittedly, it doesn't give much description. It's like, well, because of the people that, was, that were included, or because of some language um, that was included in the email. It doesn't tell you what words or anything, but it at least it's a start. So that's really good, and we should encourage that kind of thing. With these things, now you have you've sat down, and with the knowledge you've gained from your users, you've written really great, accessible explanations. Do not bury this in your documentation. Do not put it like, in the tiniest bottom of a tiny folder in the bottom of your documentation tree in GitHub. Make it front and center. Make it obvious, make it easy to access. That is important because it doesn't matter if you've written it if no one ever sees it. This is important not to be front and center. Plus, it'll make people more interested in the underpinnings of your, your project, which may lead to more contributors for you in the future. In the future, when algorithms are And I would like to thank all of these fabulous photographers on Flickr who licensed their work as Creative Commons. Thank you for the delightful pictures of cats and boxes. If you ever need to really entertain yourself, Flickr Creative Commons search for cat and box. Hundreds of pictures of cats and boxes. I had no idea the scope, and those were all just the Creative Commons licensed ones. Any questions? Yes. So, I have a couple. Um, if, with Google, right, there is some value in their algorithm not being transparent, isn't there? Because the first thing, like, if it was totally transparent and you searched for floppy leaks, you probably have your first result be a point That's what they say. Um, that's the, the justification for, for the opaque search algorithm is that, oh, well, people will start to do spammy things to optimize their sites to, uh... I mean, I understand that it's like, that's the same, off, off, like, argument for, like, not explaining the encryption algorithms, that, like, closed source is secure because people know what it does, but, like, it seems like it evolves fast enough that that could be a problem. You know, it, from their perspective, it absolutely is. From our perspective, it's not, that's not a good enough answer. This is too big and too important of a resource to trust to closed source indexing algorithms. It's like using a secret, invisible alphabet to organize a dictionary. If you have a secret, a dictionary organized by a secret, invisible alphabet, you know what you're going to have to do to consistently find things? 
linear search. You're going to have to go page by page to try and find what you're looking for. It's the same sort of idea. So yes, from, from their perspective, I understand that argument, but that doesn't mean that this is not a problem. From their, from their perspective as a for-profit entity, like I said, they are beholden to shareholders. They are tied to this idea that they have to make profit. No, no amount of don't be evil can uncouple that right. legal binding. I'm not saying legal binding. Uh, the other question, I mean, I, mean, I think it's a little over to the fact that people can always explain this to your users. I mean, some things are actually relatively complicated. And people get confused by really simple stuff. Like, explaining how, you, how a recommender system worked and why Netflix decided to recommend a particular movie to you can be complicated. I mean, they do that, right? They say, because you like these kind of movies and these kind of movies. But that's not an algorithm. That's a sort of an answer. It is sort of an answer, and you're right, that's not a fully transparent algorithm. But um, I believe it is important for us to stretch ourselves to try and make things accessible. Like, if, if crazy machine learning algorithms can be taught in school, which they were, because I took those classes, then I really believe that you can come up with a way to explain it to your user. So I guess the other thing is that, like, so if you use crazy machine learning algorithm, which I mean, like, has, which I know in the middle, of this, uh, that answers. Yeah, what, like, was, like, if they don't know how it came up with the answer necessarily. Yeah. yeah. So that's that's a good point, and that kind of algorithm, the ones that don't produce human readable models, those are especially difficult to to make transparent. Yeah. Um, and they're, they're scary for everyone, right? Because you never know when it's just going to do something completely wrong. It's true, but that's that's something that part you can explain to the user. You can explain we we built this neural net. Here's the idea behind the neural net. Um, here are the here are the things we input to it. Here are the parameters we tune on. Uh, most of the time, it produces really solid output. Every once in a while, it gives us something that we don't even understand, and and that's a good start. I I don't necessarily think. As you pointed out, most of us don't even really understand neural nets. A lot of the deep learning stuff, you're like, mm -hmm. yeah. math magic. I mean, not that I'm like calling people dumb or something, but like, I think you might be giving internet users too much credit. Have you ever seen the slide with the top 300 spellings of Britney Spears? Um, so. Like the fact that there are the top 300 spellings of Britney Spears. Language is incredibly difficult. There are many. Uh, I just mean like, like something. Explain to an average person how a search engine works can be very different. I mean, like Google has done it with certain things, right? They make these cute little animations and they sort of explain things. But, like, there's a lot of them. I mean, like, supposedly they have, like, what, like 2,000 signals now. In yeah. Well, so PageRank is actually imminently describable to a user. Uh, and then they've added in, I do not presume to. I know that, and I was looking through the search documentation, and they're like, we have a zillion different signals, and hand wave, hand wave, we're going to list like four of the things we care about, and uh, hand wave, hand wave, hand wave. And that, that's like, I assume that they're ensemble things, and they're taking a bunch of different models and then having them vote. I mean, that's, that's, it, ensemble is simple to explain. But would you be a, would you accept that as an explanation, or would you want to know what weight each one was given? Um, I think that definitely what weight each one is given should be accessible, and then also why that weight was given. And if the answer is, oh, am I done? Uh, no, no, yeah. So why that weight was given, and if that answer is, uh, we ran. 10 million experiments, and this little set of parameters was the one that provided us with the best and most consistent output. I think that's not even only understandable for, for a user. They, most people understand the tuning of things. You know, they know that there's this one setting on their air conditioner that makes it work better than all of the other settings, or like there's this this weird space on their radio dial in their car that has exactly the right volume for a particular kind of traffic. Like, tuning is something that we do in our everyday lives. So I think that 
even with weird, this is a linear weighted model on, you know, two neural nets and half a dozen uh, random forests or something. Like, these are things that people are capable of understanding. Maybe you're not going to be able to convince, like to explain it to everyone. I'm not saying necessarily that everyone will understand every algorithm. What I'm saying is if that information is not available, then no one can understand. And that's important because, well, for a variety of reasons, the information, the future information security of humanity is really important to me, but it's also important because of the bus problem. If all of your developers are in a bus accident, what happens to your project? If you document your algorithms, if you have really transparent algorithms, then someone else can pick up where you left off with much greater ease than if they had to piece through all of your source code themselves. So, to expand on your neural net uh, example, in, in data mining, there's, there's a basic rule that if you can't explain the algorithm to the end user of your model, don't use that algorithm. So, neural net is right out. Yeah. Use a decision tree instead because it's really easy to, to, to explain to somebody that doesn't understand data mining. Right, just one example. So you use, a, use an open algorithm, explain that to your end user rather than an improper algorithm. Well, so better. Yeah, I right. mean, yeah, better. 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 For yeah. optical character recognition, better would be it does a better job of recognizing characters. Well, yeah, okay. So you are, are an information retrieval or precision and recall. But I have written a neural net to do optical character recognition. And while I can't explain it now, because it's been like almost eight years, it's definitely something that I could have. It was, it was, it was good. Yeah, like ninety thousand percent accuracy for um, the characters we were working with, which was admittedly a small set of characters. Um, but I could have explained it. So I mean, the scenario that I think about is in in medicine. There's there's a lot of people watch like machines that can accurately diagnose people. Watson is actually quite good at diagnosing lung cancer and need because he has access to much more information than your average clinician. Um, orders, hundreds of orders of magnitudes more information than your average clinician. But here's a problem. On the other, Watson, I mean he's in a server rack or something, right? Like he cannot go into a patient's room and be like, hey, got some bad news for you. Someone has to take his diagnosis and maybe the recommended initiation of your treatment and take that to a patient and, and execute it. Now, in, in meteorology, as in, in medicine, most clinicians, most, most experts are uncomfortable with black box algorithms, as they should be. Um, there was the first computer that killed a person was actually um, in medicine. It was, uh, yes, it was. Uh, dosing radiation, I believe, and it fried someone. And so people are right to be suspicious of black box algorithms. So you have to ask yourself, do I potentially restrict my search base of algorithms to algorithms that are really easy for people to understand, like decision trees, like uh, Okay, like decision trees, I can't go with it. Yeah, yeah, so, so I guess, I mean, the, the argument, like, this logical extension of it is sort of everything should be open source. I mean, like, not great, but, like, do you think that that is should be open source? Like, I mean, like, should Photoshop have to open source their algorithm for, like, healing images? Um, in an ideal world, I yes. Yes, but, like, but that's not. In, in, in a world where I have to choose what I care about, I care much more about the accessing of information. There are open source algorithms for healing images. I'm sure Git has one. Yeah. yeah. So, and there, are, and there are open source algorithms for indexing tags yeah. on the internet. I mean, is it Google's job to give it? I mean, I, like, I'm not saying it's not, I'm just curious. Like, is it their job to do this? Is it just because they've become dominant? I have another question. Go for um, So, uh, you're, you're focusing on, on like, like, a, is it possible to explain these things? And I, I'm, I was more interested in the, 
like why is it important to do this? And I, I, when, you, when you have the example of the mapping, and what if the mapping was not designed around getting you faster there, but to make you go past certain places? Um, and I, I, it was like a week ago, I, I watched a video where they did the psychology experiment on people, and they were they picked them up in a car, and they took some, them somewhere and had them like do this creative task, and then they showed them that that in the room that was already with them, they had like some papers, and on them was was drawn basically what they came up with. And it's like, well, how is that possible? And then they showed that in the car ride, they passed by buildings that had pictures oh, in windows, yeah. buildings, and 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 uh, or passed by things that that you know there's a physical thing that matched something and that they had just been primed in the hour before that to have certain ideas in their head when they did a creative task. So they thought it was a purely creative task that was coming out of their brain, but as you said, you only can deal with stuff that you get as input. And they fed input into them without them even knowing that they had gotten the input, and they did that by just their car ride. Right. And so yeah. your, your mapping directions even mapping directions can could be insidious. Exactly. Um, I just have a comment. Um, I am doing my thesis on transparency advocacy from a political perspective. So transparency in government, like the Obama administration's initiatives to make government documents available to citizens and how Freedom of information is supposed to allow us access to documents that democratic citizens feel entitled to read, to at least know what's going on. Um, so I see intersections with like this kind of algorithm transparency, even in the way our government is run. I mean, the thing about not making things transparent is that an elite educated class of people, whether it's the government or engineers who work for Google, have access to information that could benefit the whole world. And I think that if you're going to be an open source citizen, you have to think more about the role that the elite people play in the way the world is run, and how transparency across all levels can really benefit where we need to go as a society. And also, I think transparency is extremely important. Important, like along the lines of what you were saying, like what is going on in like the NSA regulations and all the algorithms that are being used by our government, essentially to gather data on humanity that we have never, we don't even know, right? Like, I mean, just amazing amounts of information, and no one's being transparent about it, um, unless you're a journalist. You know, that's an excellent point, um, especially the trans transparency facilitating um, more equal opportunity. I, I was reading this directly with NPR some time ago about a an educated black woman in the South in the 1950s and how her um, people would come to her to manage the bureaucracies that were attempting to ruin their lives. Uh, because she had access to a different set of information, a different set of inputs to this crazy, opaque, bureaucratic algorithm where she could go in and signal that she was a particular kind of person. She had a, you know, a particular oh, yeah. suit and a particular, uh, you know, she projected that she was much wealthier than she was and that this gave her preferential treatment within the bureaucracy. So. Um, yeah, that kind of transparency is absolutely important, I believe, to a free and open society. We can talk more about the intersection. <coughs> we might have to have one more question than the gentleman in the blue in the back. Mm -hmm. uh, I had several thoughts, but I'll, I'll be quick on it. Uh, one area that uh, algorithm transparency comes to mind where it's a uh, critical business aspect is you go into the, look, the finance industry where they uh, have to determine, for instance, is this algorithm racist or, or not? And that's a very important real concern for them. And uh, they almost take the view of uh, a testing mentality as they interrogate the algorithm with questions of is it racist, is it uh, 
uh, unfair in some way, and that it's almost a, a testing suite of, of how should this algorithm be functioning. So maybe even if we can't explain the algorithm and exactly what it's doing, because there's a lot of compositions of, of math that make it very difficult to piece that out, we can at least look at the how it's interfacing with the uh, social sphere and uh, verify that uh, it's meeting the uh, criteria that we see as important. That's a fantastic idea. I really like that. I will be in the Hacker Lounge tomorrow, definitely in the morning, probably near in the afternoon. Um, if you want to stop by and chat more, I think we probably need to make this room so someone else can <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.